Welcome friends, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, public opinion and a lot of what happens in the media and a lot, lot of what happens in the political field and in public life as such is attributed to public opinion and that's one term that is uh, so often used in so many con uh, contexts that it's important for us to have a clear understanding of what public opinion actually is. Is it just an aggregate of opinion of individuals or is it an objective fact in itself? And how have we come to the present uh, uh, context of public opinion and how media plays such an important role in public opinion? So uh, public opinion can be regarded as an aggregate of the individual views, attitudes and beliefs. So uh, we'll talk about the differences between views, attitudes and beliefs in, in, in details later on. But uh, that's one uh, way of defining public opinion. It's an aggregate uh, 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 of the individual uh, beliefs or, or attitudes or even views. And it's expressed by a significant proportion of the community. So if a significant proportion of the community is not expressing that view, then that would not, not be regarded as public opinion. And we have that interesting uh, definition by VOK, uh, who said that opinions held by private persons, which governments find prudent to heed. So if governments don't find prudent to heed, then probably that's not regarded as public opinion. Uh, before we begin our discussion on public opinion, very important to uh, understand the uh, lipman dv debate that went on uh, about public opinion. And this is a, a seminal book by uh, Walter Lippmann, uh, published in 1922. And in the, in the first chapter of the book, he talks about the world outside and the pictures in our heads. And that's where he uh, uh, provides an overview of how uh, the idea of, of public opinion might be uh, uh, distorted in certain ways. And uh, he talks of the structural barriers which uh, prevent uh, ordinary citizens from gaining access to truth. So that's a very important uh, way of looking at public opinion. So let's uh, discuss what Walter Lippmann has to say on public opinion. So uh, Walter Lippmann suggests that the artificial censorships and the limitations of social contact, because everybody is, is not uh, going to uh, uh, have, have equal access to information, to people, to documents, and they're not even going to have equal attention to public affairs. So that is one structural barrier which, which makes it difficult for people to have a clear understanding or have an overall understanding, holistic understanding of public affairs. And uh, this, this distortion also is because of how the mass media puts its message across. So they have to be compressed into very short messages and that makes it very difficult to understand the complications of the real world. And according to Lipman, that's, that's an important uh, barrier to uh, uh, correct public opinion or to uh, form correct opinions. And uh, he also goes on to suggest that human beings are not equipped to deal with so much subtlety and so much variety. So this is a direct quote from the book. Uh, uh, and so many permutations and combinations that we have to go across in, in uh, our, our everyday life. And that is why uh, we have to, uh, uh, you know, since we have to interact in that kind of an environment, we have to uh, reconstruct whatever is happening in, in the real world into a much simpler model. And that is why he suggests that this, this uh, makes it into a kind of a pseudo environment. Uh, there's another book that he wrote uh, around that time and th that is known as the Phantom Public and that is uh, again, you know, this this kind of an, uh, a view is, is strengthened in this book as well. So this suggests that the random collection of bystanders who constitute a public, uh, uh, even if they had uh, had a mind, they, they will not be able to uh, uh, get, get, get a very clear understanding of, of what, what everyday politics is about. And he in that book, he even suggests that uh, a common man is not supposed to know the, the intricacies of physics, for example. So how and why should he be uh, uh, expected to understand everything about uh, politics? And that's where uh, that's, that's, that it, has, it has had a lot of contention and a lot of debates uh, on that. That uh, uh, Lipman suggests that the ideal is to leave uh, uh, this kind of, of, of uh, opinion forming to more or less eminent people who have a clear understanding of what is happening. So th this is where he uh, uh, suggests some kind of proxy to uh, a professional public. And uh, we'll see that that is what is known as democratic elitism, where uh, 
intelligence is or, or, or decision making is not done by all the masses but towards a centralized body of intelligent elites and as we can understand on the face of it this this uh, this uh, appears problematic because we are not uh, uh, providing that agency to uh, human beings we are just providing it to certain class of people whom we assume will who are better equipped to uh, provide uh, judgments or to uh, provide uh, uh, in, uh, opinion on important issues English jurist James Bryce and is a very popular historian as well uh, in in 19th and 20th century in late 19th century and early 20th century he suggested that since people do not have the leisure or an inclination to arrive at a position on every question that that concerns uh, the public so it will not be proper to, for for governments to uh, uh, have have their opinion on, on all issues so as as, you, as we can understand we are just trying to uh, uh, kind of uh, give give a crux of the argument. This there's a lot. Uh, this is a lot more layered. But uh, he suggests that the government, based on popular consent, will give the nation a very great stability and strength. But public opinion should not determine the details of policy. So we can see that is also one element of democratic elitism we see in this kind of an argument. Uh, this was uh, challenged by DV, and uh, although there are a lot of uh, uh, similarities between DV and Lipman's argument, also, but one of the important thing is that uh, the argument that uh, human beings are uh, uh, passive spectators is, is probably not correct. So the argument that uh, everybody is passive uh, and and uh, it has to be an, and and uh, representative democracy is 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 uh, not the right way to go about it. That is that has been uh, challenged by uh, John DV. And the uh, suggestion is that democracy is an end in itself. Democracy is not merely a means to an end, but it's an end in itself. This is an idea of community life itself. So the democracy provides uh, citizens uh, both self-realization and a fraternal association. So the idea that uh, people do not uh, spend a lot of uh, cognitive effort in in uh, making decisions is, is probably a uh, flawed in in John Dewey's argument so uh, in uh, early 20th century there has been a lot of debate as we just saw in these uh, three works uh, just before so this is from Robert C Binkley and uh, these were the kind of, of uh, uh, ideas that people were thinking about uh, public opinion so the first and most important is whether there should be one single public opinion so whether there's a necessity for one single public opinion to be there and whether we are regarding opinion as public because of the subject matter or to the kind of people who hold it so is it the subject matter that that decides whether an opinion is public or is it because there are certain kind of people who are holding that opinion and uh, the third important part is to understand that what part of the public must conquer in an opinion what uh, part of the public must agree to the opinion to make it public so is it is it majority and what kind of majority and what must be uh, uh, what must those people who do not agree with that opinion do so should they acquiesce to that or should there be resistance to this opinion so there are uh, as, as we can understand lots of uh, ideas about uh, how we decide uh, how we describe public opinion So, uh, as we've seen, political scientists have regarded a public opinion as equivalent to national will. So, this is a reflection of what the national will is. But as we'll soon see that social scientists regard public opinion as a product of social interaction and communication. If we are not communicating our opinion to our peers and to our colleagues and to, to our fellow citizens, then there will be no public opinion. So, unless uh, uh, members of the public communicate with each other, there is no... Uh, uh, public opinion so this expression of of your at, uh, beliefs and your attitudes and values is very important for the formation of public opinion and for the realization of uh, public opinion uh, Irving Crispy uh, provides uh, the, these important uh, uh, standards for for the public opinion process so it, it's an interactive process it is multi-dimensional and it is continuously changing so we'll talk about uh, this factor of, uh, of uh, you know, whether it, it perpetuates or whether it, this, this changes uh, uh, at regular intervals. But uh, firstly, there must be an issue. That's the first important point of uh, uh, public opinion. And there must be a significant number of people who have an 
opinion on the issue and they express their opinions on the issue that that's important so uh, just there's an issue and people do not express opinions then the, then there is no public opinion and some of these opinions must reflect some consensus so people have all these opinions so there must be some kind of consensus in at least some of these opinions and these this consensus must also have some kind of an influence towards policy making so this is this in crux is what uh, public opinion is according to Irving uh, uh, Crespi. So uh, we know that uh, individuals have a perception. So often, uh, whether it, it may not be correct, it may uh, be correct. So all, all of us do have uh, opinions on certain things. So, uh, but when we talk of public opinion, it it is it is it is uh, regarded as something which is independent or something which is an objective social fact. So when the media talks about public opinion, it is about an objective social fact or it's, it's something independent from, from what individual opinions are. So as I said earlier, beliefs uh, will not constitute a public opinion unless they are conveyed to others either through the mass media or social media or through phone or through computer mediated communication or through other conversations. So communication is very important for uh, public opinion to take uh, shape. So uh, now it's important for us to find out what an opinion is. So uh, we uh, we know that opinion is a statement of preference. So we uh, when we say that we have an opinion, uh, we, we suggest that we have a preference for one side of an argument or one of, of the choices which is presented to us. But at the same time, there's a there's a thinking process goes on. So it's, it's a cognitive process, but we also judge according to our values, according to our beliefs and, and so many other things. And we evaluate those opinions. Uh, so it has a specific character and and uh, and a person can have many opinions on different topics without any necessary cohesion. And it's also provisional because our opinions keep on changing. So we're saying that opinion itself is, is, is a multi-layered co uh, construct. And uh, uh, there are uh, uh, many things which determine uh, how, how we form opinions on a given issue and, and whether that opinion stays with us or not. So we've already discussed the importance of the environmental factor. So that's one factor, your uh, political, social and cultural environment that decides uh, what kind of opinion we might have at that point of time. Of course, mass media has a very, very important role to uh, play in the public opinion process. And we'll talk about the impact of uh, mass media or the influence of mass media in our everyday life. Uh, there are interest groups uh, at certain places and uh, they, they are, are capable of influencing opinion at uh, one point of time or, or to a certain kind of people or to a certain group of people. So interest groups are also an important factor that influences uh, public opinion. Then, of course, there are influence uh, opinion leaders or influence uh, influences, as we say these days, uh, who, who determine how public opinion is, is uh, formed on a certain issues. And there are uh, complex uh, cognitive and, and psychological and all these issues uh, uh, which, which uh, help us uh, form opinion at that point of time on a given issue. So there are uh, uh, multiple uh, factors and, and they might be working at the same point of time uh, in the same, uh, on the same issue or with the same person. So, so there are quite a number of factors which influences public opinion. So opinion vary uh, in strength. So there are certain opinions uh, which, we, which we strongly hold on to or, or uh, there are certain opinion which, uh, which we, we, we correct when we get uh, more information on that. So uh, uh, when we aggregate this uh, and uh, you know uh, when we aggregate this opinion then we are talking about some predominant leaning or, or some of views of the population. So when we aggregate the opinion that's when we talk of public opinion. And uh, this is from Alex D. Tocqueville and uh, he suggests that once an opinion has taken root among a democratic people and established itself in the minds of the bulk of the community, it afterwards persists by itself and is maintained without effort because no one attacks it. And as we said at the beginning, this is what happens when we talk of uh, public opinion because it, it has, a, uh, uh, has an objective value. It is accepted as a social fact because everybody has acquiesced to it or everybody agrees about it. So that's a very important uh, uh, characteristic of public opinion that it, uh, it perpetuates uh, by itself. 
so uh, now we uh, talk about uh, the attitudinal systems uh, in human beings and we've already spoken about uh, how uh, values and interests and how knowledge and belief and how our feelings and behavioral interests uh, uh, contribute to uh, forming of opinion so it could be uh, so these are very different uh, terms so, so so a value for example could be a strongly held belief and knowledge and belief uh, is, is is based on evidence and feelings are 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 are, are our effective responses to uh, various uh, information that is uh, uh, provided to us and it again depends on 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 the different mechanisms we go for for uh, understanding about about uh, various situations and also uh, our uh, inherent beliefs about certain thing so for example we have this uh, uh, confirmation bias where we if, if something does not conform to what we already believe in then there is a resistance to that kind of an information so uh, attitudes are are valuations and attributions made by individuals so when we talking of uh, public attitude we we uh, talk of uh, it in, in in a group or aggregate and we'll just see that opinion is often uh, referred to as an a uh, public expression of these attitudes so public opinions are basically verbal expressions of these underlying attitudes and measurement of opinion uh, might uh, uh, provide us an insight into attitudes we'll talk about opinion polling at the end of uh, today's presentation and there we'll find out how uh, these uh, opinions are measured or how how they are polled so uh, uh, it is it is possible uh, and that's what uh, the attitude theory suggests is that if uh, uh, you have a certain attitude uh, if we change uh, by changing opinions you, your attitude can change or vice versa that if you change opinion your attitude will change or if you change attitude your opinion will change so there are various dimensions of this cognitive turn in communication so dennis mcquill gives us a very comprehensive understanding about how media impacts opinion and attitudes for example uh, how much we are impacted by a particular media message or a particular media content depends on the perceived authority legitimacy and the credibility of the source if we regard the source as credible then probably we are going to take it more seriously the second important feature of uh, media which impacts opinions and attitudes is the consistency of the content of media messages whether they are co consistent whether they are repetitive whether they are uh, uh, bringing us a, a similar kind of information in various ways so that's a, a another uh, factor that de de determines the impact on opinions and attitudes and of course there is this attachment and loyalty to sources so if you regard a certain source as uh, credible or 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 if you are attached to the, the those, those particular sources or if you or if you identify with 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 the with the uh, sources then their uh, uh, message will have greater value for you and of course what are the motives or what are the uh, uh, reasons that you are using that media content for the, uh, that particular uh, time it's also about the amount and quality of attention paid so if if we are paying more attention to the media message and we are spending more cognitive resources on those messages then probably they'll have greater impact on us so that again is related to the uh, fast thinking system and and uh, slow thinking system that we have discussed in in uh, another video also the congruence of the content with existing opinion so if the uh, media content is, is is similar to the beliefs then that i hold then uh, that will have greater impact on me or that will have uh, then i'll use that to reconfirm things that i already believe in uh, the skill and appeal of message and presentation so what are the persuasive skills they are employing to uh, uh, convince us that again is, a, is an important factor of, of uh, media impact and again the support from personal contacts and environment so whether uh, what we see in our environment and what we discuss with our peers whether whether that, that is very similar to what the media is presenting so as we can understand there's a, there's a, a different there are different ways of looking at uh, how media impacts us or how we use the media content provided to us uh we'll talk about the different approaches uh, to to public opinion so we are going to talk about three major approaches to uh, public opinion in the next three slides uh the first of this is the populist approach this assumes Uh, that public opinion shifts as individuals interact with each other so it depends on the individuals so if if i have a particular opinion and i interact with a lot of other people who have have a, a different opinion then then my opinion might uh, uh, change or it might evolve 
so that's one approach uh, which which uh, uh, provides the centrality of, of of the human agency to the uh, opinion formation process Uh, so this social constructionist approach uh, assumes that communication has these manipulative aspects and there are uh, uh, various uh, strands of opinion on, on a particular issue and people are trying to uh, 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 establish the predominance of one opinion over another so this assumes that uh, the the uh, elite uh, have have an important role to play in the uh, 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 public opinion process and uh, uh, people uh, uh, form opinions based on 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 a number of other factors and not on the uh, factor of just their interaction with others uh, of course there is the critical uh, 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 approach to uh, opinion formation which suggests that the general public has absolutely no role on public opinion which is largely controlled by those in power through through their various apparatuses so this is uh, also known as the radical functionist approach where public opinion is is uh, is more a reflection of those in power or or the expression of public opinion is is a reflection of uh, those in power uh, we'll now discuss about the various theories around public opinion and there are a number of ways in which uh, we discuss about how public opinion is formed and how they are expressed and one of the most well known theories is uh, that of the spiral of silence by elizabeth noel newman where uh, she suggests that opinion expressed in public differ from those expressed in private and uh, there are reasons for that and uh, in the next uh, slide we'll talk about uh, how the spiral of silence uh, works so uh, there are three important elements of spiral of silence the first is that society threatens divine individuals with isolation and this fear of isolation is pervasive that uh, we we are we are extremely scared of being isolated by our peers our colleagues and and those who matter to us so this try, this causes us to try and assess the climate of opinion at all times that we are trying to find out what is the dominant shade of opinion and our behavior or an open expression of an opinion is based on this assessment so this leads to a certain kind of a spiral of silence if i assume that my behavior or or my opinion is not the dominant opinion then i will be extremely careful of not expressing that in public and that is a very very important uh, aspect of uh, public opinion that it's not only about what what people say in the public but uh, what what they hold uh, uh, to themselves uh there's another very important uh, part of uh, uh, public opinion and we'll be talking about uh, the media theories about public opinion as well but this is about the knowledge gap theory about how different people react to uh, different content in the media and the one is this uh, knowledge gap theory which suggests that if we have prior information about uh, certain things or if we have prior knowledge about about certain things and we get to know more about those things then it will be much e easier for us to fit in that new information but if if uh, if uh, it is that information which i have not been exposed to before or which i have decided to ignore earlier then i will not be uh, elaborating on that information uh, a lot more so this explains why a lot of these campaigns do not work a lot of social campaigns a lot of political campaigns a lot of marketing campaigns because uh, our idea of of uh, of uh, what what exists or what is what is reality is 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 dependent on 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 a number of factors and if which i already regard as as something that i know and i get information that is that is uh, uh, that adds to that information then it's much easier for me to take on that information uh the propaganda effect has always has been studied uh, after world war 2 in, in in various ways and uh, uh, that's also one one aspect of uh, public opinion that that uh, has to be uh, studied and uh, it started with, with last wells study uh, as i said uh, after world war 1 uh, and uh, world war 2 basically and uh, his theory explained how public opinion can be cultivated and organized around master symbols and that was before this this uh, uh, advertising and branding and all these things about symbols that we know and also about how propaganda films influence uh, thinking about so uh, thinking about uh, certain things so the, the, we we know about these uh, hovland experiments and uh, 
uh, uh, we, we found out that propaganda films would work only in certain conditions where we already believed in, in those kind of things. And if, if we did not believe in those kind of things or if we had inherent opposition to the, the, the kind of propaganda which was provided in those films, then we were less likely to be affected by that. Uh, we have also uh, 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 known about, about the personal influence theory, about the two-step flow uh, hypothesis uh, by, by, by uh, Lazar's field, about the role of opinion leaders. So it's not always about what uh, media uh, uh, tells us. It's also about how opinion leaders uh, act as gatekeepers and uh, express their opinions to us uh, through our interpersonal challenge, uh, ch channels, for example. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how, how uh, media influences uh, public opinion. So there are uh, three or four ways in which uh, media influences uh, public opinion. And one of them is by publishing this opinion poll result. So when, when uh, there is an opinion poll result, media is telling us that this is the existing uh, uh, public opinion. And uh, that is how they can influence uh, public opinion in one way by suggesting that this is the uh, national will or this is the public opinion. Or also, they could be using their editorial columns to suggest what is the public view. So uh, we understand that media has, has a very important role in, in creating uh, public opinion in, in, in that form. So uh, as we've already discussed, that uh, when they bring in new uh, information, which, which people uh, uh, are not comfortable with, then they are less likely to uh, influence attitudes and opinions. And uh, they, they, can, they can change only by, by, uh, by repetitions of these messages, as, as we've seen uh, when we discussed uh, uh, McQuail's ideas about how media impacts uh, opinions and attitudes. So uh, there are, uh, there's this very important concept of uh, mediatization and why media is, is uh, such an important element of, of uh, the opinion formation process. First of all, the media extends the natural limits of human communication. So uh, it's not just related to how and what I communicate with my fellow beings, but it, it's also about what the, the media discourse is. And often the media substitute the social activities and social institutions. So a lot of uh, uh, activities we, we uh, just see on, on uh, media and, and we uh, participate in that vicariously. So, so it, it's a substitute for a lot of these social interactions. They also amalgamate with various non-media activities in social life. So uh, even our non-media activities, they have a media element about what media has to say or, or uh, what, what is it that the media regards as, as dominant and not dominant or as proper as a not proper. And uh, the, the uh, actors in, in, in the society, they are also uh, influenced or impacted by what is known as the media logic. So there are, there are these elements of mediatization that, that we must be clear about. And of course, there is this uh, uh, idea of, of the public sphere where uh, it's, it's, it's an idealized public space where, where uh, uh, citizens, they voluntarily and autonomously, they get together to discuss on issues of uh, uh, public interest, of, of general interest. So that is uh, one idea about public opinion where uh, people get together on, on a public space and it's, it's the strength of their argument which helps them build up what, what is uh, uh, the right public opinion or what is the, uh, uh, over, uh, what is the general will of the people. Uh, agenda setting, of course, is a very, very important aspect of media and it uh, uh, is, is what uh, gives media uh, most of its power about because it tells us uh, uh, what, to, what to think about. So public agenda generally originates from, 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 from uh, the media agenda or we've seen the correlation of the public agenda and the uh, media agenda. And uh, as we know that there is always, always a, uh, you know, a sense of competing interest and people want to promote their uh, salience of their issues. So one group might want one particular issue to be there in the, in the media agenda. The other uh, group would want the other thing to be there in the media agenda. But whatever is there in the media agenda becomes the talk, uh, talking point for, for the real world. So uh, uh, this is a very important role that media performs in uh, the initiation of the public opinion formation process. So uh, one, one of the reasons is that uh, the, the outcome in the media or, or the exposure in the media or the relative uh, prominence given to issues in the media, this gives 
public uh, recognition to the current agenda and it also provides uh, us with uh, what could be uh, uh, an opinion or what could be an evaluation of of, uh, of that particular thing which is uh, covered in the uh, media so so we'll be talking about the first and the second level agenda setting effects so it's not only about what to talk about but but how to talk about it so media has a very important role to play in that because as we know this uh, they, they provide the visibility to uh, certain kind of issues and that's what uh, uh, we uh, say so media is not only about uh, telling what to think about but also how to think about so we'll see there are uh, uh, resonances with with the framing concept here as well uh, another important uh, factor or another media theory that has a very important uh, factor to play in, in the public opinion process is, is known as the uh, third person effect. So it suggests that uh, many people think that other people are affected by various kind of media content that we are not affected but others might be affected. So that's when a lot of people uh, they, they e e even uh, uh, lobby for, for, for some kind of censorship because it might they think that it might impact others badly. So uh, it it uh, it is it is a very important uh, attribute of of media about uh, and and about uh, media consumers about what we want to see in media and what we do not want to see in media. Uh, priming is also an extension of the agenda setting approach where uh, individuals assign weight to particular issues when they make evaluations uh, of, of 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 a particular government. So what are the yardsticks on which to measure a government or what are the yardsticks on which to uh, measure the legislature or whatever. So the priming effect is another effect of the media which has an impact on the public opinion. So when I'm judging a particular government or when I'm judging a particular regime, what are the issues that I should be thinking about? And that is where the media primes us to, to one of those evaluative criteria. And that again is a, has an impact on the uh, public opinion process. So uh, we, we just said that uh, it, the priming hypothesis suggests that mass media by making some issues more salient influences the standards by which the governments are judged. And uh, of course uh, many people regard framing as an extension of the second order uh, uh, agenda setting that we, said, uh, that we just discussed. So framing makes certain aspects of a reality more salient. So that the media is, is promoting a particular problem definition or, or, or even a causal interpretation. So, so you are providing salience to, to not, not to the topic but how to cover or, or how that is explained in, in the public. So framing news framing is a, a very very uh, important aspect of, of uh, the public opinion formation process. I have discussed framing in, in much greater detail in another uh, video of mine. So uh, in the last part of today's presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, polling and uh, how, how it has been done and uh, how people have how regard public opinion polling as. So this is uh, one very recent book about from, by Jacobs and Shapiro. It, it says politicians don't pander and it suggests that politicians track public opinion not to make policy but how to craft their public presentation. So that's a very important uh, way of looking at uh, uh, public opinion polling that we are trying to find out the public opinion not to change our policy but just to uh, uh, make a, uh, just to uh, uh, kind of craft our response to those policies in public. So when it uh, came about in the 1930s, uh, uh, polling was, uh, uh, and uh, it was uh, George Gallup and, and his company which started this polling and uh, this was one, uh, this was regarded as one empirical way of finding out the will of the majority of the citizens at all times. And it was also supposed to provide a democratic counterweight to the political elites. So we keep on asking people about their opinion on various issues at various point of time. And we uh, present that as the will of the majority of the people and that's how we keep pe uh, people in power in check. And this is also a solution for the growing uh, democratic uh, deficit or that's how it was portrayed as. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, what George Gallup had to say in this uh, book uh, in his article on uh, the changing climate for public opinion research in 1957 published in the uh, public opinion quarterly. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it was uh, 25 years of public opinion research which started in uh, 1932 as I just said. 
So here uh, George Gallup suggests that without polls, elites would be guided only by letters to congressmen, the lobbying of pressure groups and the reports of political henchmen. So according to uh, George Gallup, this is one very authentic way of finding out what uh, people actually believe in uh, or what the uh, uh, national will is. But there are a lot of people who do not agree with that kind of assessment and they say that public opinion does not stimulate, stimulate public discussion but it prevents or even replaces it. And the main purpose of public opinion is, is, or public opinion polling is, is not to, to find out what is the public opinion but as I said a, a, a little while earlier the main purpose of polling by government could be manufacturing citizens opinion and changing those which are not congruent with the course of action, thus marginalizing the power of public opinion. So we find out the uh, state of public opinion to uh, 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 convince people who don't agree with our point of view to agree with our point of view. So it, it uh, marginalizes the power of uh, public opinion. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation in today's session.